this is the episode. But anyway, uh, thanks for uh, doing this follow up. I had such a nice time talking to you last year, and you were the very first interview uh, when I started to do this. So I thought it's a good time to do a little follow up because almost hey, like, back to round two. Here we go. Round two. Um, yeah, because like almost an entire year has passed. Not quite a whole year, but close. So, uh, what's going on, man? How's how's life like? Are you, wh- how, what do you think about all this? Can you believe that it's been almost a year since all this pandemic shit has started? And and you know, are you fatigued with with uh, life and stuff like that? How you doing? Well, I mean. To be honest, I'm doing great, and and um, yeah, it's been a it's been a really fast year. That's for sure. I mean, it seems like time's gone by relatively quick, considering we've been yeah. locked up, you know. Um, but well, I I gotta be honest, it's it's kind of been yeah. refreshing to to have yeah. the opportunity. I'm sorry. I'll go ahead. I think I was breaking up. I said. It's kind of refreshing almost to like have the opportunity to have just really been doing nothing other than writing and, and um, hanging out with my family and, and, and just avoiding the world, which I really don't have a problem with, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I kind of feel the same way. I mean, but you, you've had a, such a, bigger, more high profile life with your various endeavors, whether it was baseball and being in the public eye and that, and and then doing punk rock singing, you know, in the off season and having a a pretty high profile. Um, So, and you also always struck me as somebody that was, uh, especially after all these years of your baseball thing where you like you don't really give it all away. You, you probably figured out, you know, I have to protect myself. I have to pre- uh, protect my family. Um, and you don't really seem like a, what am I trying to say? You have your bullshit, you, you have your bullshit detector on. So your natural state is just to like, kind of do your own thing and not involve a lot of people and, and have your family and that's it. Am I wrong in that assessment or? No, I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, I, I've always, uh, I've never really been Mr. Sociable guy. Um, I don't really know if I, if the high profile thing is, I mean, I, I think I was involved in a world where um, maybe other people might've been more exposed. I just kind of, I kept to myself and really always kept things close to me and stayed within my own little circle for the most part. Um, yeah. I, 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 not to say that I don't enjoy having conversations with people, um, but I'm not like the person that's going out looking for it. And, and um, so, yeah, I've always, I've always kind of kept to myself and, and, and the bullshit detector is always on. I mean, it's got to always be on because the whole world's full of bullshit. So um, there's always somebody trying to pull some kind of an angle one way or another. And, and um, I don't know, I just, I, I don't know if I'm completely introverted, but I, I definitely like to keep to myself and, and kind of, um, yeah, do my thing. Yeah, like, and, and then when you do venture out from being a, a family guy, you have a small group of people that you've known for years and you play with most of them. And um, you're, you've always been really big on using the expression, well, you know, we just added this person to our family, like, uh, like Trey, for instance, Trey Kleinsmith, mm-hmm. your recent addition to the band. Um, we've known Trey since we were kids. That's a long fucking time ago. And, and you know, when when you talked about him uh, joining up with the rest of you guys, it was like, well, you know, he's family. So um, you're pretty big on that, I think. Or, or maybe all of you guys are pretty big on that. Like you and Mike were just sort of, you know, Mike Harder. Somebody else that we've both known for a long time. Um, that's very important to you, I think. Uh, I, I would say, like, definitely in the band. Uh, you know, my 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 friend group, if you want to call it. Um, 
to be honest with you, it really hasn't grown a whole lot in the last 40 years. It's, it's kind of what it was. And I mean, I've met some really nice people along the way, but I don't know if I've really bonded these uh, special friendships or super close friendships um, like I have with the people that I kind of grew up with, I guess. Um, yeah. But, but certainly the band, the whole aspect of that was, was, you know, the, the, the premise from the beginning was to start this fun outlet of writing and playing music. And it was, it always had been a family type thing. Um, and even the, the people that there's really only two members that, that I didn't know previous to, to starting Pulley, which was Tyler, our bass player, who's going on 25 some odd years now. And yeah. Chris, the, Chris, the drummer, who's probably getting close to 10 years. And there is, they're just, as much family as, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're part of the crew and, and um, I feel just as comfortable talking to them about anything in life with whether it be their families or issues they have going on. And, and so there's, there's definitely that bond, but yeah, th that the band was, was specifically designed with that in mind was, was to be that tight so that we could fight and we could argue and we could disagree, but it was always going to be healthy and it wasn't going to be, uh, there wasn't going to be like any animosity held toward towards each other uh, or holding grudges because, you know, we were family and that's what brothers and sisters do is you argue and disagree. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And then the whole premise of starting this to have fun, you, you guys seem just as jazz to uh, create music and, and, and play music when you can. And like uh, that dedication is something that, it seems like it's been pretty, uh, has been unchanged since the very beginning, back when we were kids. Like, I got my drum set up over here, and I haven't, I'm starting to play a tiny bit, putting like, you know, I, I, I want to do that again this year when things kind of get better with the pandemic and stuff. And like, the inspiration is just like, I like, I like drums. I would like the idea of playing with other people and, and doing that kind of thing. Um, so like I, I feel like that motivation is is the same for you guys too, except you guys are lucky in the fact that you've had this, you know, I went to your practice room a few times and it's like you guys have had that practice room in Chatsworth how long now? Like 25 years, 30 years? Yeah, maybe 30 years. Yeah. So for me, somebody that moved away from where you guys were so long ago to be able to go back there and see a lot of the same faces. And that you guys are all friends and you that's that's kind of comforting and not just holy there's like all those other guys and like, yeah yeah like trey's other band i don't right. know still have those trios with yep. uh, kevin and i forgot the drummer's name but um steve steve, steve yeah yeah and they're so and, like, they've, and they've been a part of like that people so that like me too i guess that's very comforting Yeah. Yeah. Can I hear you? Yeah, you can hear me. Oh, okay. You're just smiling because it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but that's that's really great. That's really great to like, you know. Um, well, you know, you know, it would be really cool is if that clubhouse could have ever actually been a club. Of course, it probably wouldn't have lasted thirty years, and it kind of really <laughs> kind of has been a club, I guess, minus the the bar and and the you know the the hanging out, but. Um, it, it's, it's such a great meeting place and, and you just never know. Like I, I was hanging out one day um, and I'll throw a name out at you and you'll probably laugh, but I was in there writing with Trey uh, a couple months ago and just out of the blue, he's driving by and he sees a couple cars and this is like one o'clock in the afternoon. So he decides to pop his head in and it's Matt Nestor, you know, the old fatal error guy. And here's Nestor pops in and it's like, Oh, Hey, I saw some cars. Just thought I'd come. I haven't seen the guy in God knows how many years, but it's like yesterday. And so we start talking and next thing you know, a half hour goes by and, and it's just, it's really cool. You know, it's, it's cool to have that meeting place. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of like a clubhouse. Like I can't even believe sometimes when I'm when I think of that, Oh man, I'm still around and being the age I'm at and, and talking to you and, and talking to other people from our, our, our time period and, I mean, no, no, just the idea of being able to go to a clubhouse like that. And, and, 
even though people have families and lives and probably second marriages and who knows what you guys have talked about to have that at this point that's pretty awesome i think it, and it's cool like like we're gonna go uh me mike and trey have for the most part um put together 12 or so songs probably since the last time i talked to you um yeah. almost a full record and we've eliminated quite a few and that goes back to like that 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 kind of brotherhood thing where you know Mike, Mike and me still have a relationship and yet he'll throw a riff my way and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll shoot it down in, in, in short. I'll just kind of, ah, I don't really know. I can't sing over it. And, and so he'll move on. No, no hard feelings. Um, but so we've got these songs together and we've been, we haven't really all been there at the same time, but we've been bits and pieces. I've, I've got with Trey, I, you know, I play drums. So I go there and I write a lot of the songs on the drums and, and I've actually demoed, I think 10 of the 12 songs with me playing on the drums. And yeah. so I, I sent them to Chris, the drummer, and we're actually going in a couple of weeks and he's just going to lay down some, his drums so we could kind of make this cool demo practice tape for all of us to practice to. But the thought of like going there and the inspiration, it, it's cool that like there's still energy in that room. And when you go there, it brings out creativity and, and the energy's there and the inspiration's there. And, and I think good things happen because we write a little bit at home, but it seems like when we get there, it, it starts to evolve and in, in, into, into an actual song and music. And, and you can just see the smiles on each other's faces when we're in there playing. And it's, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I don't know exactly what the day's gonna be, but I know it's coming up at some point in the next couple of weeks. Right, and of yeah. course, eventually that's gonna lead to an actual next album for uh, for sure and, and 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 you know since i believe since the last time i've talked to you we've uh we've released a couple of of previous releases on vinyl yeah and so they've come, they've come out on vinyl a kid up in canada it was great um just called out of the blue he, he would be a kid that would come to shows and you know he's got his french accent scott i want to start a record label and i, I want to put out the pulley records and and so uh, he, he decided to put out the, the, the last two on Epitaph. And, and uh, we worked out a deal with Epitaph through licensing and, and, and he was able to, and then the pandemic hit and it slowed things down, but he eventually got both records out. And I believe they're still being shipped as we speak. We haven't received ours yet, but, but I know they're in the mail. Yeah. And, and then he reached out and, you know, there's a company in Europe, a company called Spam, a guy over there, Stefan, Stefan, and another guy, Tom, and other record labels that kind of work together and distribute in their, in their regions or in their, you know, their, their own little continents. So this guy has shown a lot of interest in a new record. And, you know, he's talking about, I'll help you with money recording, I'll help you with money mixing. And, you know, those are things that like for a band, if you can secure the recording costs, then let's write a record, you know? And, 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 and then it seems like vinyl is going to at least pay for it. So I, maybe digitally and vinyl will, will, will help secure the cost. But, but um, so far, I think the songs we have are pretty good, but I know once Chris puts his drums down, it's going to like, it's going to really inspire everybody. I know Tyler's going to, you know, he'll put his parts down and, and then by the time I get, because I've been singing over just a guitar and drums and it's yeah. me playing drums. So I can't even imagine what the songs are going to sound like when, when, uh, when it's everybody, but the fact that we have a label behind it and uh, he just, you know, they were just part of releasing the last couple records um, or I should say a label that has interest. Nothing's final yet, but um, that's just, it's, it's kind of inspiring and, and giving us a little bit of motivation to get things going. The only bummer is, is, is there a rush? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the biggest pessimist, but I, I just don't see realistically me. I don't care how many vaccines you distribute. I just don't see this summer life being normal and concerts happening. And I, I just don't, I just, it doesn't seem feasible to me. No. Uh, so maybe we take our time and we record over the summer and who knows, maybe by late fall, winter, getting into next spring, maybe there's a little bit of uh, a hope that, you know, some of the smaller clubs and there, there is some 
gatherings of some sort where bands can actually play live and then it's worthy of putting out a release you know right but I, i'm not sure. a doctor i don't have a crystal ball but that's just that's my my predictions yeah i was kind of thinking what like um it's nice that there is somewhat kind of like a light at the end of the tunnel but um a lot of that depends on human behavior too and um you know the last year sort of taught me more than ever that you can't really control anything or anybody and the way people acted last year in regards to, you know, um, I'm gonna make wearing a mask into this thing where I'm gonna act like I'm persecuted because I'm just asked to help my fellow man, my fellow American, the least patriotic thing you could ever do since these people are all about being a patriot, but they're not, they're just, you know. So, um, you know, with thinking about human behavior and stuff like that, it doesn't really give me a lot of hope, like you said, that things are going to get suddenly better by the summertime because, you know, and I can't help but overthink it a little bit because, uh, you know, you got this vaccine. Well, now you got to wait for uh, everybody to be able to get it. And then I thought the other day, wait, there's a lot of people that are probably going to refuse to get it just because, you know, do you remember like when you were a kid and you got like uh, shots for, uh, I don't know, smallpox or whatever yeah. do you, did anybody did anybody back then ever object to getting a smallpox vaccine or think that that's a front for the government to inject a microchip into your bloodstream that's going to control you know like it's it's absolutely bonkers crazy so with all that i think uh yeah i think it's going to be a little while and i also thought that just because I got the vaccine and, you know, Kristen or the children or your children or whatever, that doesn't mean I necessarily trust that it's going to be, uh, everything's going to be hunky-dory and that people still aren't going to be, you know, I don't have a lot of faith in, you know, I don't have a lot of faith in everybody overall for that. So I'm going to be very cautious when I get that vaccine and what I do after I get that vaccine. And uh, yeah, I, it's kind of one. It's kind of one of those things where, like, like you said, with the human behavior, it's like almost like a tug of war. If 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 there's this big divide, and we're not all pulling on the same side of the rope, so called believing in the same thing and, and trying to help one another, the vaccines they've already proven that you can still contract a virus with the vaccine. Yeah. There's no guarantees, and and I, I definitely think that those people, <clears throat> whether they are restaurant owners or, or club owners or the regular Joe Blow that works at a desk in a cubicle, for all those people that think life is going to go back, if, if you're not going to think outside the box and be a little forward thinking and, and, and make the adjustment for the future, life's not going back to the way it was. It's just not going back to the way it was. And, and yeah. I personally, I think I'll be wearing a mask for a long time. I'm, I'm kind of accustomed to it now and, and I actually feel protected. I, I don't yeah. mind it. And when I see other people wearing masks, I feel even safer. So yes. I, I, I'm on board with it. And, and I, why not? You know, I mean, but, but that, why not? Why, why, why make it? I just, I just didn't understand what the big fucking deal was. You know, you want things to get better. Wear a fucking mask. What's the big fucking deal? We, we had a, you know, I, I don't know exactly you hear different reports around the country of, of how things are in different states, but I know personally here, um, you know, at least in, in our county up here in Ventura, we're probably a little more in a little more of a bubble where I think people are somewhat intelligent and they're not really fighting the system or they haven't fought the system. But, right. but you, get, you get down into LA and Orange County. And I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a restaurant in, in Huntington beach where the guy publicly comes out and says, I do not allow masks. If you want to come to my restaurant, you're not allowed to wear a mask. This is, you know, two, three months ago. What kind of idiot opens a public establishment, you know, and, 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 and announces that? That's just stupid. Like, what kind of fucking idiot does that? It's just I me. Mean, you know, we, we, we went for so long. My feeling was we had the opportunity back in March and April to really kind of set precedent of how things were going to be and we didn't do it and and we gave a little bit of freedom 
you know, okay, so these restaurants, and at least out here, you know, because they had the weather and it was summertime, they invested into these outdoor areas and, and they were, they looked relatively, I guess, safe. I didn't personally go myself, but, but there was tables spread outside of these restaurants. They were in the parking lots and, the, and they put up these tents and they, they did a nice job of trying to accommodate patrons. And, yeah. and then for some reason, they said, oh, we're gonna allow indoor dining, which was like the dumbest thing in the world because the, it's, it's, never, it's never regressed. It's only continued to just climb and climb and climb. So, hey, let's, let's let people eat indoors for a week. And then, and then, and then all of a sudden, you know, the numbers spike, you know, through the roof and now we got to try to backtrack and it's really hard to take away what you've given. And, and that's yeah. where I think that's, that's the problem. That's, that's where I think we made the mistake almost a year ago was, you know, I'm not that, you know, I want to be in a communist type setting, but I, it would have been nice to see some iron fist come down and say, this is the way it's going to be, you know? Oh, oh man. And, and, uh, and, and, and also, um, um, just thinking about um, our now former president of the United States, which I, that blew my mind. I thought for sure he was going to win just because I just thought people are just so dumb that they're going to vote for him again. And then luckily, it seemed like more people hated his guts overall, regardless of what team you're supposed to be on or. I'm a Republican, and that means as a Democrat, you're this or that. It just seemed like more people totally disagreed with how he basically did nothing about the pandemic. He didn't do I'm, shit. I'm with you 100%, and, and, and I'm not a supporter by no means, but I do think he probably would have won if he just would have had a little bit of empathy towards human the human beings during yes. all this. And he yeah. had zero. All he was doing was whacking golf balls on a golf club, you know, on right. a golf course. And, 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 you know, like you said, people don't realize until it hits home. And I've, I've read so many, so many sad stories about people that say, well, I wasn't a believer in this. And then I went to a party and, you know, pulled my mask down for a photo. Next thing you know, I got it. Country, you know, gave it to the rest of the people in my family, and my uncle Joe died in you know 76 years old. And believe me, this is real. Well, it takes that for someone to realize like this is real. It's not yeah. make believe yet, you know. And and we can sit and, and preach on and on. And I think we're we're kind of in the same boat. It's like me personally, if you told me I had to lock myself in my house and someone was gonna drop a box of food off of my front doorstep and I couldn't go outside for the next two years, I would do it. Yes. I would do it if that's what it was going to take. I yep. would do. I would do my part. And the the sad thing is, we gave the freedom to everybody. And I mean, when I drive around now, it's it's scary. Life's normal. And I think to myself, like, well, in March and April, it was just starting to scratch the surface, and now things are a billion times worse. But yet everybody's out and about, and it's like eh, life's normal. I don't. I just don't get it. I don't get uh, it. Kristen here has a great theory about that that she thought of literally the first month it happened. We went to we went to the I don't know if I told you about this. We went to the Grand Canyon at the end of last year before all the stuff started. Um, she flew out to Los Angeles and we were going to rent a car and drive across the country. Our first real vacation. And I have never actually driven across the country myself personally. I haven't even driven across Mojave Desert going past Las Vegas. You know, we had a great time. We went to the Grand Canyon, and you, I guess you've been to the Grand Canyon before? You know, I, I've really never been there. I've kind of been past it, but... Okay, but if you go to the Grand Canyon, and if you are a normal human being, when you get there, you're going to look at it and go, that is the most amazing... Like, wow. Like, wow. But also, yep. at the same time, you're going to be like, holy shit, that's fucking scary. You could... Yep. Look how massive that is. If you just go on the edge of this thing and fall over. You're, yeah. You're, I mean, you're, you're just, you're going to fall 500 feet and it's just miles and miles of this awe inspiring thing that you should be afraid of, you know, that you should just be fucking scared of. And when we went there, we saw all these fucking idiots taking their children out on the edges of these fucking cliffs because they're taking selfies or whatever. It's like, it doesn't register to them that, the uh, the danger of 
dancing on the edge of Grand Canyon. It's real. Yeah. And, and, and Kristen's like, well, that's kind of like almost like the pandemic is like this invisible sort of Grand Canyon that's too massive to really comprehend and be really fully scared of. You should respect it and just stay the fuck away. And she was just like, that's kind of like how people are reacting to the pandemic. It's like this, this thing that apparently is not going to touch them, but they're like dancing on the edges, not wearing a mask, <laughs> not, um, not respecting other people making it about themselves in a really pathetic way of getting attention and not recognizing the danger. It's like a, it's like an oral <laughs> version of the Grand Canyon. So to speak. Yeah, it's the, guy, it's the guy on the family vacation who's going to roll down his window and try to feed the bear in front of his family. And then you see the bear running off with his arm, you know? Right. That's it. <laughs> Come on, yeah. man, let's go. Yeah. It's like, you know, I just felt like I've just been sitting here waiting for humanity to go, okay, come on, let's let's take this seriously. Let's just fucking and then the whole like, yeah, I think dipshit ex-president would have won if he and I'm not a fan of him um at all, but if he actually had even done, like you said, the smallest amount of anything to show that he gave even even lied about giving a shit. If he did anything. How about just recognizing and calling it by its real name? Did you ever hear him say COVID? Nope. Ever? Never. Nope. No. So, nope. I mean, like, he didn't even, like, recognize it for what it was. He didn't even call it by its proper name. I mean, so, yeah. Anyway, that's... Yeah, that, that was... And that was we blew it, man. We blew it. And, and, and it's sad because hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives. And who knows how many more are, are going to. But but we kind of blew it, and we didn't take action when we didn't take action when we could have, yes. you know. Or like I should you, say, certain figures didn't take action when they should have. No, we took action. I, I I I hate to even include myself in there, but if we're all Americans and we're all in it together, then you know this is the most patriotic thing all these people could have fucking done. Is just you don't have to like everybody in 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 a free society, but as a member of a free society you are obligated to just do the right thing. You know, if people came and put back their fucking shopping carts to the, a shopping center, you know, you know, if people came and fucking do that, you know, it's like, of course they're not going to do. You know. I, I, I'll probably piss off a lot of people by saying this. And, and, and I don't mean this in a way where like, I enjoy it to the fact that like, I, I enjoy watching people get ill, but like, I've almost enjoyed it. I've almost enjoyed it, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm okay with it. Like for, for me personally, I'm okay with, with the way th with the way I have to live my life right now. I, I, we have an artist that, that's done a couple records for us. His name is Mark DeSalvo, painter, uh, yeah. illustrator. And I got an email from him yesterday. I just I hadn't talked to him in a while. And I, I wrote him reaching out to him, just checking in. And, and he wrote back to me saying, cause he was a part-time bartender slash artist, you know? And uh, couldn't really do the art as a full-time thing. And so he says, you know, the pandemic's been great. He says, I've enjoyed so much time with my family. I've been doing all this artwork. He said, it's just really exhilarating and refreshing. He goes, I don't think I'll ever be bartending again. And I thought, well, that's something great that came out of the pandemic, you know? And, and like, there's a lot of good for a lot of people that can come out of this, you know? And, and like I said, I, I don't want to say that I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, I love the pandemic. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. You, you can't actually go out there. I'm glad all these dumbasses are dying. And they're the ones that, you know, I know what you're saying. But yeah, I mean, like, um, it's been crazy, you know, but at the same time, life for me, even though we're here, you know. Has, your life, of, really, has your life really changed? I mean, really? No, no yeah. it's actually, in some ways, it's actually been better. That's, that's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, it's not good in the fact that, yeah, it'd be nice to um, go eat somewhere in public. It'd be nice to be able to take take my daughter somewhere, like swimming. Yeah. It'd yeah. be nice if it was back in some sort of special needs school. But as far as like how I am as a person and, you know, how, how you know, my family are, you know, it's a lot hasn't really changed. I mean, we're, we're kind of introverted, loner sort of, uh, people that are creative and, and that's just what we do. And that doesn't, that just doesn't involve a lot of people. 
I guess it's just having the choice removed for me that I don't like. But you know, sure, I'm not going to fight it. And you know, um, I was I was hoping that people would do the right thing. And like you said, everybody blew it, and that's just kind of how it is. It's been a real exercise in just realizing that you just you can't control anything or anybody, and people are just going to do what they do. And you know, that's kind of unfortunate, but it's it's really out of my hands, your hands, we just have to sort of protect ourselves and sit back and just. You know, the, the, the real back. sad thing, the real sad thing is, uh, and maybe this is probably going to sound pessimistic, but I'll, I'm betting you that in six months from today's date, if we get back on a Zoom call again, we could be talking about the same shit because I don't know how much progress is going to be made. And that's, that's what bothers me is, yeah. is, is I know that, I know that you're doing your part and I know I'm doing my part and I know yep. all the people that I know that I'm close with in my circle are doing their part, but you know, there's just too many renegades and, 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 and crazy people. Like you said that, Hey, let's take a selfie at the edge of the cliff. How dumb do you got to be to, to want to fall 20,000 feet, you know, <laughs> pretty dumb or, you know, just like, um, not to get, not, not to go back to the political stuff, but I couldn't help but be more, motivated that way this last year i just felt like i had no choice because these idiots are dragging me into their 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 stupidity you know it's like i'm a very live and let live kind of person if you're not personally hurting anybody fine whatever everything is debatable but when your beliefs can kill you or other people that's you know time out yeah, yeah. And, and just like the whole uh storming of the white house and all that shit it just it's like that's oh, just that's just, stupid Totally stupid. But once again, like, that 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 was that was motivated by an idiot. I mean, you know. Yeah. Well, that, remember when we um, remember when we were kids and we go to shows like Olympic Auditorium and stuff like that, and there was always, you know, punk rock gangs or um, skinheads and, and things oh, yeah. that people that people write about now in almost like romanticized glowing terms. Like there was so much glory involved, and, all, and, it, and it was. And how bullshit it all was because all skinheads were were weak-minded cowards that couldn't think for themselves that were attracted to some older idiot that had some sort of charisma and they would just do his bidding and he would convince them that they were somehow oppressed you know yeah. and, and that's and what's going on with these people now the kind of people that would storm the uh what? It's almost like these are like the new skinheads or something. You know, and and I, I, I never pay attention to that kind of stuff. Whenever I think of skinheads, I think, oh, those people still exist. They're, yeah. there's, there's, there's people that still- Maybe in a different, a different form, different format, you know? Yeah, totally. But it's like the same thing. It's just weak-minded, stupid people that can't think for themselves. And they're just going to be attracted to some- charismatic idiot that's convinced them that they're somehow being held back it's a great way of not accepting responsibility for your own failures and and tribulations in life like well yeah. who can i blame who can i blame because i'm not a billionaire right now it's those people you know yeah. so, so i'm gonna wear this stupid costume and whether it's like a skinhead outfit or having a beard like mine right now and dressed in camouflage and being all about your guns and go, you know, it's like the same shit. It's and it's so stupid. And it's like another example of you just have no control over any of that shit. And that's really frustrating. I mean, I don't want to control people, but um, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's um, it's really too bad. Like you know, martial law, or it would have been too bad that uh, if the National Guard did make sure people fucking stayed at home, I really wouldn't have a problem with that. Well, I remember, I remember early in the spring. I was following the, the baseball stuff and, and there was a outbreak in the, you know, there's base professional baseball in Japan and Korea and of course in the U S and, and I remember this guy doing an interview, a former pitcher who used to pitch for the Marlins in, in Florida and he's pitching over in Korea. And so Korea had this outbreak and they got shut down. And so he's doing an interview from his apartment and he's talking to the American reporter and he's saying like, Oh yeah. He's like, the streets are deserted. I'm looking out the window. There's nothing out there, but you know, guys in, you know, boots and guns. And he goes, you don't step foot outside your house. You're not even allowed to go outside. He goes, this is how they're controlling the pandemic. 
Now, I don't know if that was martial law or what, but they were strict on their rules. And the Korean baseball, they, they found a way to start up their, their season. They started the whole thing with no fans. They were the first professional sport team in, in the world, I believe, to come back and actually play as a group. And they did it isolated away from fans, but they you know, kind of had their little bubble thing. But, mm-hmm. but the guy's comment resonated with me. And, and I always remember him saying, oh, that'll never work in the U.S. Like, you guys could never do that there. And he was saying this back in March. And of course, he was right. And, and this is an American, American who is in a different country, different culture. And he's witnessing, wow, this is totally different. This is serious shit. Like, this is how you handle something. And, and he knew. And like, like I said, he had mentioned to the reporter, no chance it'll ever happen there in the States. And it didn't. And... Right. You know, here we are. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know, but but like I said, there's there's been good. I'm sure. I'm like, you, you've got a ton of work. Like I said, I I know me personally. I, I've I've been a part of writing a complete record. You know, both lyrically and musically, and I feel yeah. pretty 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 satisfied with that. Looking forward to recording it, and and my family stayed healthy, and and um, you know, that's really all I can do is be accountable for accountable for my own self and the actions yep. that I've taken and, and, and um, stay away from the idiots that, that want to take a selfie at the edge of the cliff. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we feel exactly the same way. Uh, um, I can only be accountable for myself and for protecting my family and just not being an idiot. And there's nothing I can do about, it. I mean, I, I don't know. Another thing I think is weird is that people are just desperate for attention. And I think having all this time to sit and stew on things for people, I understand that's very frustrating. And my answer for all that, it's kind of stupid for me to think that. My answer for everything is well, just do something creative. Just everybody has something that they need to do, you know, just that you enjoy doing, just do that. Whether it's writing or playing music or writing a song or or drawing or painting and because that's always how I've been wired but I'm dumb I'm you know I'm also naive enough to think that well that's going to be the solution to uh everybody and like you know I, I think everybody should do that and hey, that's how it is you know the, you know you know how the you know how the winds can get here and, and see me so the last few days it was 40 50 mile an hour winds and you know, about a year ago, they'd have a they'd have a fire because some power lines went down. So I think the power company now, they're a little more proactive and they shut down power in certain areas uh, just to keep. So so like they give you a warning and they say, hey, there's a potential that the power could go out in your your area on this particular day. Well, the yeah. winds were so two nights ago, um, the winds were just I mean, it was just like gale force winds. I mean, ridiculous. I thought the trees, these hundred year old eucalyptus trees were gonna blow down. It was so bad. And yeah. it, was two, it was two consecutive days. So the first day it was about one o'clock and our power went out, you know, the TV was on, whatever. And all of a sudden everything went off. It's like, ah, oh, bummer, we got no power. So our first thought was shit. Um, well, what do we do with the food in the refrigerator? You know, we didn't want it. Well, we just didn't open the refrigerator up. We left it closed. and. So now we're like, now it's like 10 o'clock at night and I'm, I'm getting down to the, to the simple aspect of like, like you're talking about being creative. So it's, we got these candles all around the house. It's, ten, it's pitch black. Our dog's like wondering what the hell's going on. <laughs> right. it's, just, it's just my wife and my son at the house, but here's the three of us sitting in the living room with these candles. My son's got his guitar and he's playing guitar and we're actually sitting there talking like having conversations and and it was like it doesn't get any simpler or 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 better than that right there if that could happen almost every day i think that'd be the most productive thing in the world for all of all the hu- entire human race it was like for, fuck the internet fuck the ipad fuck the phone fuck the tv it was like everybody was just sitting there in candlelight having a conversation and it that's, was that's very yeah, well, it kind of reminds you of what's important too. Um, I, I'm no stranger to being distracted with social media, um, I, and I've benefited greatly from it. But the the uh, the downside to all that is pretty obvious. So um, yeah, it would 
Every mm-hmm. once in a while, you need a break. And, and if Mother Nature is going to give a, a built-in break, it was just, it was refreshing. That's all I'm saying. You know, it's like, I, I, I enjoy it just as much as the other person being able to have those those uh, outlets and the, the options to be able to use that, utilize that stuff. But because there's a lot of great information that helps me through life that, that, that I do. Um, well, sure. But it, it was just, it was kind of peaceful. That's all. Yeah. You know, that, a, nice, a nice relaxing moment. Yeah. Um, um, so how are, um, when you brought me, started talking about the winds in Simi Valley, we've never really talked a lot about my old stomping grounds, but, um, Remember when we were kids in Simi Valley and every fucking fall when the weather started to get, no, no, no right as the summer was um, over going into fall, um, and then the eventual um, fires that would surround Simi Valley would start? That was oh, yeah. every year, right? That was literally every fucking year, right? It still is every year. Right. I mean, now, did anybody really bat an eye when we were kids about that? Or Because or, I notice now that whenever it happens, people have decided it's because of this one thing. But it's always been that way. There's always been a lot of wind. There's always been fires every fucking year since I was a kid in Simi Valley. But now people seem to think it's because of, like, it's, it's, is, it, is it any worse now than it was when we were kids? It seems like it's about the same, right? It's about the same. And if anything, I'd say that, you know, obviously the, the way they handle it, they've got a, they've, they're, they're better at, you know, being able to track them and, di- you know, kind of diagnose the direction and all this and that. And they're, you know, they, how they do those back backfires and, and burn stuff. And, and they're just more proactive now and they have better ways of fighting it with the helicopters and things, but, yeah, they've uh, had years. but there's been some, there's been some good ones here lately. I mean, I don't, I don't know why. And I don't, I don't want to say I don't remember them as a kid because I do. I can remember sitting in my mom's front yard and, you know, of course in Simi Valley, you can see the mountains that surround the town for the most part. And I can remember, I can remember at one point looking North, South, East and West, and there was a fire at some sort on every one of those mountains. Uh, at the same time. Yeah. Um, but man, there's been some, there's been some that have gotten out of hand here. I know in the last handful of years, why I don't know, but um but I don't know if they've been any worse. I think they've always been. There's always been fires. There's always been wind. Yeah. Well, it's been covered a lot more now. So now people are like, well, because of global warming, like, well, it was just as warm when I was a kid. It was exactly the same from what I remembered. I just remember that you just reminded me of that. Um, Simi Valley was like, I didn't realize it till way after the fact, but it was an okay place to grow up. It was really pretty. I, I, I don't know if I could have really appreciated how pretty it was back when we met and whatever. Because it really seemed like life only really got exciting for me after we started um, hearing about punk rock and maybe getting out of high school. Or like, like, like you know how some people, like for, for some people that we knew, high school was like almost the high point of, it's, it was going to be the high point of their lives. Yeah. You remember? Some people were like that and oh yeah i i don't know about you but i barely remember going to simi valley high i don't remember hardly fucking anything or anybody except for you and um uh, and some of the other people and like scared straight or punk rock people i don't remember anything which yeah. is crazy because some people remember everything about their high school and i do not there's people i've talked to to uh, social media, like, yeah, you were the kid that drew and stuff. And I just have no idea. I just don't remember. Yeah. I, I'm sure you, I'm sure you could understand, like, and I, I guess I understand where our parents were coming from when it, when it came to raising a family, it was just far enough outside of LA where you were still there, but it was yeah. like secluded and it was, it was suburbia. And it was kind of like, we were in our own little, bubble surrounded by those mountains and it was relatively safe and yeah. and it was a good place to it really was a good place to grow up i mean we weren't on the streets we weren't now granted was it exciting for us to be able to drive 20 30 minutes and see the you know lights of hollywood and you know the action and all the asphalt of course it yeah. was you know and and that's and that's what every teenage kid wants is to be able to feel that but i i, I know what you're saying like i didn't appreciate it then like i do now like when I, you know, I, I, I'm sure my kids feel the same way I felt. It's like, oh God, growing up here, I want to get out. 
you know, um, and, and I can't blame them, but I know that where I'm at in my life right now, I'm, I'm content with, eh, it's, it's not bad. It's, it's, it's actually okay. You know, it's, uh, it's still far enough away from what I would call the hell zone, which is, you know, 30 minutes away. And, right. and, it, and it's nice to be able to just drive over that mountain and then feel like you're kind of almost in a different world. Now, granted it's grown and it's, you know, the population's bigger and it's spread out and there's, there's, there's been more shopping centers and houses built, but it's still yeah. attract. It's still attracted. Uh, uh, I would say uh, it, it hasn't attracted. I don't want to use the word riffraff, but like it, it's still kind of a safe place to be. You're not. You can go walk the streets at night. You're not going to get mugged. You know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. How much more time do you got before you have to go? Um, I got about another fifteen minutes. Okay. Uh, well, I like I like talking about Simi Valley because, um, um, yeah, because it's been so well, long. I know, I know exactly what you're saying, and I'm not on Facebook, but I've I've seen a couple of of like people like uh, Kevin who plays bass in Dos Trios. So yes. Kevin Kevin Plummer and, and his brother Nevin. I was friends with Nevin. Kevin was a year older. I had always known Kevin, and we'd been friends forever. Um, but I saw a Facebook thing one time and I saw like all the friends he had. Now, th I don't know anything about Facebook. And I'm going to be completely honest. I don't, I don't know how it links. And I saw your name on there and I was like, oh, well, Brian's friends with Kevin. And it was this list of people like, oh my God, I couldn't, I couldn't Chris Erickson, guy used to play drums with Steve Carnan in that band Major Disturbance. And the guy Rich was the singer. And, and I'm thinking, I haven't heard that name in, 30, 40 years. And, yeah. and it, it's, it's just amazing to me that like the, the, I don't, what, what, what would be considered like the, uh, it's almost like a family tree, but without being the family part of it, of this link to all these people that, Oh yeah, I remember you. Well, you really don't remember me because I don't remember you and I didn't really know you, but now that we're 50, you're reaching out to me saying, Oh, Hey, what's up? It, <laughs> Is it, is it really that cool? I don't know. I, I haven't been a part of it, but I was blown away at the linkage to all these different people. Like remember Morgan Anderson who used to play bass with us. I, I, I actually, I, uh, I have uh, Morgan has been very nice to me online and we have talked a little bit and he has purchased some of my artistic wares. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. But how close were you with him? Well, I wasn't close with him, but I, you know, it, it's, um, yeah, I, I mean, I met him around the same time I met you guys. And, you know, back then, six months was like 10 years. Yeah, know? for sure. So, for sure. Like, really, literally from the time that, because he recorded the Nardcore bass tracks. And then he was gone, and then Eric and me came in. But, yeah, I, did, I know what you're saying. I didn't really know him. We weren't that close. But one thing that Facebook is good for is, is talking to um, maybe people you don't remember that well, but um, they're, it's a nice sort of pleasant interaction. There's a connection there? Yeah. A little connection. You know, I, you know we're, I'm not going to be talking about all the great memories we had because we didn't really know each other that well, but it's, it's pleasant enough. I mean... I, I, I just have a feeling that like... I'll, I open a Facebook page and I couldn't even, if I did, I couldn't even imagine the amount of people from see me that, that would be like, I forgot about, you know, that would like pop up, pop up on a screen. And I don't know, maybe that would be cool. Maybe, it, maybe it wouldn't be cool. I don't know. Well, I, I guess it depends on if, if they want something from me or not, but um, yeah. you know, like, um, yeah, I, I, I really literally do not remember anything about high school. I don't, you know, and there's a lot of people like a, uh, there's a guy that went, that lived in Simi Valley, um, a bunch of people actually, but there's one guy named Victor that was a drummer. The drummer. But I don't remember. He ended up being in Red Cross. He played in Red Cross and yeah. And a bunch he of other people. Him and, him and another guy, uh, a local guy who worked at Music World, his name was Jason. They both ended up playing with Alanis Morissette for years. Right. But I don't, I mean like, and I met him once. And he, hey, yeah. man, 
Valley guy, but I, yeah. I really don't remember him. And then there's a few people, I, there's a few people that I never met that were like younger than me that I knew about and ended up, uh, there was a guy, he passed away. He was friends with Tyler and probably some other people, but he played bass in Saccharine Trust. Oh yeah. So Chris Stein. Chris and Stein. Right, and he's a Simi Valley guy. And I've talked to him a little bit online and unfortunately, you know, he lost his life to cancer. He battled it for a long time. And, yeah. uh, you know, but he's like, he was like this incredible bass player and super nice artistic guy, but he came a generation after us. He was so, a couple years after you, yeah, because because he right. played with he played with a with a guy named Gabe, and I can't remember the other kid's name, but the kid had a skate ramp in his backyard, and, and they had a band called Citizen Down, and, okay. and towards the towards the end of Scared Straight, we had played a lot of parties with them in See Me, and actually a couple of shows in the Oxnard Ventura area, and uh, and then Chris kind of just for some reason all of a sudden he went on and became like this Mike Watt type bass player and, and just hooked up with the SST guy. Guys and, and and made a career out of it, which was awesome. And yeah, that was a sad tragedy. It was a couple of years ago he passed away, but it was a, yeah. that was a bummer in our community because he was a pretty well liked guy. He was only, I mean, if you had stayed for another year or two, you'd have met him. So yeah, he was like not a, that far behind. Right, and um, and then there was that uh, was Jim Cherry, a Simi Valley guy too. Yeah, they were yeah, they were more like Royal High School side, so. Until like, until the city kind of meshed together, it was, it, yeah, I didn't really meet those guys till later on. Yeah. 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 So I, um, is there like a, a huge uh, influx of Simi Valley music and musician activity that um, I would be surprised to hear about now, like 30 years after I moved away? Um, you know, I, I couldn't tell you at the moment, but I know like, a few years ago, we had the skate park. We were trying to do a monthly thing with a lo couple local bands, and there was a there's a, there's a guy. Uh, there was a shopping center right down the street from where our parents lived. He had like a little space, and he and he had rehearsal rooms, uh, stage one or something. The name was called, and he would bring the gear free of charge, like the you know the PA and stuff, and he would let these bands play, and we would charge a couple bucks, and we would give the bands the money. And um, I was blown away. Like, of course, I didn't know anybody. And sure. there was, there was like, you know, a hundred kids showing up. And I thought, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, I hope these kids are stoked because I know times have changed, but what I would have killed for a place like this when I was 16 or 17 years old to be yeah, able to go, had... there was nothing. And, yeah. and, you know, now, now they're, you know, of course we've got this warehouse with skateboard ramps. We're, we're trying, we're not competing with clubs, but the kids are accustomed to like, you know, going and seeing real concerts and things like, like we weren't, and and I thought it was pretty cool, and I and I, I realized, man, there's actually a fucking scene here in town. Like I knew nothing about it. There was local bands, and they were pretty good, and some yeah. of them were pretty good. And there was like five, six different bands that were playing over the course of like the six month period we were doing it, and it was pretty cool. And I'm and they were super appreciative, and you know, both guys and girls, and it was kind of fun to watch. And I felt like an old man, but. Yeah. It was, it was, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching them and I, and I could totally relate to where they were. They were all 16 to 18 years old and they were mm -hmm. stoked out of their minds. They would get to hang out on a Friday night somewhere that wasn't illegal and it was a cool thing. And there was live music and they were with their friends and they were having fun and, and it's exciting. it was totally innocent and it was yeah. super cool. And, and, and I guess maybe there was a, little bit of like wow i feel kind of proud you know like to be able to to see this happen and there was no nobody ruined it it, it was all good there was no assholes and nobody came from outside the outside the scene to kind of fuck it up so yeah. that's that's about the only thing i could say as far as is there something new i guess there is I, i'm not totally in touch with it to be honest with you but but it's there I, I, yeah i have no idea what goes on around around me in raleigh at all I mean, I have, yeah. I've been, been outside of all that for a long time. You know? Yeah. Um, I'll leave you. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get going because I know you got to go to the dentist, but I'll leave you with my favorite memory of going to um, your former place, Skate Lab. Um, I remember my brother, Mark, dropped me off there and we were all standing around and there was some sort of show or activity going on. 
and there were all these cars of pe people's um, moms dropping them off. And I think he turned to me and said, I wonder how many of these people, these parents are people that we went to school with and we have no idea what happened to them. And here they are all these years later bringing their children to this punk rock sort of thing. And I was like, I probably say that's, there's probably a lot of those people that. You know, yeah. You know, I yeah. was like, yeah, I felt, I felt pretty young that day too. Yeah. I'm sure you did. Yeah. <laughs> I continue. Age is just a number, right? That's I'm, what. I'm enjoying it to be honest with you. I, I got no I, problem with it. But, well, yeah, but that's usually what people younger than you will tell you. Age is just a number. You're only as old as, as you feel. Well, that's debatable. Well, <laughs> sometimes you feel like shit. 